Welcome to podcast number seven in our series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we take a look at the colony of Maryland. Maryland was founded and for most of its existence ruled by the Lords of Baltimore. Of all of England's North American colonies, Maryland was founded on the most medieval tone. Yet the efforts of the Baltimores to carve out a medieval-style kingdom in the wilderness quickly melted away under the realities of what it took to survive in a foreign and sometimes hostile wilderness. Maryland is unique among the colonies in that it was the only colony founded by Catholics. This fact alone guaranteed a certain amount of political turbulence. The first colonists to arrive in Maryland were better prepared for the realities of colonizing. They had learned the lessons from neighboring Virginia, which had already been in existence for 25 years when the first Marylanders arrived. As a result, Maryland avoided the agonizing disasters that nearly destroyed Virginia in its early phase of colonization. The story of Maryland begins with a man named George Calvert, who was probably born near the year 1580. Calvert had enjoyed royal favor and had held many offices in the king's government and had even been a member of parliament. However, all this came to an end when he had publicly announced that he was a Catholic, because since the time of Queen Elizabeth, there were laws in England prohibiting Catholics from holding public office. As I have mentioned in previous podcasts, it's hard for modern Americans to understand why religion would be such an issue. But we have to remember back then that there was no separation of church and state. In fact, church was part of state. And churchmen held important offices in government and had a lot of power and control. When Protestants and Catholics could, they tended to persecute each other. So this was more than just simply a religious preference issue. Nevertheless, Calvert enjoyed royal favor, and the king elevated him to the peerage, making him the Baron of Baltimore. So now he was nobility. Baltimore had been watching events in North America, and he had already owned a colony in Newfoundland. He knew there was money to be made there, but he wanted one further south where he thought he could do better, so he petitioned the king. Despite opposition from Virginia's leaders, the king granted Lord Baltimore the land we call Maryland. Baltimore named the land Terra Maria in honor of the queen, who herself was Catholic. The phrase Terra Maria is Latin. In English, it translates to Maryland. Unfortunately for Lord Baltimore, he died just before the process of making the grant could be completed. So as fell to his son, who inherited his title as Lord Baltimore, to undertake the first colonizing efforts in Maryland. The charter that the king granted Lord Baltimore gave him palatine powers. Let me explain what this means. In England, since medieval times, certain powerful lords were granted palatine powers by the king, especially along the Scottish border or in other areas that were remote that might have to deal with upheavals, political rebellion, or invasion. These palatine powers made these lords almost like little kings in their own right. It made sense to give Lord Baltimore this kind of power since he was establishing a colony that was in a remote frontier and he might need those kinds of powers in order to deal with invasions, not only by Indians, but also by other European nations. In a sense, Lord Baltimore was like a little king all in his own right. He could even grant titles of nobility to other colonists living within his colony if he felt like it. In fact, colonists who came to Maryland had to swear an oath of allegiance to Lord Baltimore. No other founder of any of the other colonies in North America, at least on paper, enjoyed more power than Lord Baltimore did. Late in 1633, two ships, the Ark and the Dove, loaded with colonists and supplies, left England for North America. After a circuitous route through the Caribbean, the colonists arrived in Maryland in March. They landed at St. Clement's Island, several miles up the Potomac River from the Chesapeake Bay. Today, this island is located less than a mile off Colton's Point. Here, they erected a large cross made of hewn logs and tree trunks. This land, or new land that they had just arrived at, left a lasting impression upon these colonists. Previous English explorers had mentioned how large the Potomac River was. There was nothing like it in England. The weather was also very different. Maryland is hot, humid, warm, and sunny during the summer, and sometimes given to violent weather and even hurricanes. One of the things that made an impression upon the colonists that several noted was how dense the forests were. Everything was heavily forested in Maryland. 
The next thing the colonists did was to purchase some land from the Indians about 10 miles east of St. Clement's Island, which was a good location because it gave control of both the Potomac and access to the Chesapeake Bay. They gave the Indians hatchets, axes, rakes, and cloth in exchange for this land, some of which had been cleared of its heavy forests because the Indians had been growing corn there, so it was a good location. It was here that they founded St. Mary's City, which would be the colonial capital until the 1690s. Lord Baltimore himself did not participate in this expedition, though he spent 40,000 pounds sterling of his own money to finance it, which was a huge sum of money back then. Few of the Baltimore lords ever actually lived in Maryland. They usually appointed a governor to run the colony. Often this was a family member or other trusted friend. Certainly Lord Baltimore's intention for setting up the colony was primarily to make money, but he may have also had religious motives. He may have hoped that Maryland could serve as a refuge or place of refuge for Catholics that were enduring persecution. People back then were horribly ignorant of the geography of the North American continent. The Chesapeake Bay itself is a very complex place with ragged shorelines, inlets, and lots of little lakes, islands, and rivers, hundreds of miles of shoreline. It would be very difficult to chart and map this area. But the ignorance went further than that. Some of the cartographers at that time thought that a few days' march through the wilderness could lead to California and the Pacific Ocean. If this were the case, England would be in a good position to start trading directly with the Far East. Of course, they didn't realize there were several thousand miles still yet between the East Coast and the West Coast. The ignorance about the geography also meant that often the charters, which were granted to colonial founders, had errors in how they described the land that was being granted by the king. This led to constant disputes between the colonies. All of the colonies were engaged in disputes about where their land ended and began. In fact, these disputes led to sometimes to armed conflict and even after the War of Independence and even into the period of the colonies becoming the United States, there were still conflicts about where the boundaries of these colonies were. Lord Baltimore spent much of his life in court in England in litigation about where the colonial boundaries of his colony were, especially with William Penn, who owned both Pennsylvania and Delaware. This led to the famous Mason-Dixon Line, where the surveyors Mason and Dixon surveyed. Today in the United States, this is a famous boundary because it marks the demarcation between North and South. One of the first things that Maryland's colonial leaders had to deal with was a trading post settlement on Kent's Island that refused to acknowledge the government of Lord Baltimore. Kent Island is a large island that's right in the middle of the Chesapeake Bay, and it was positioned in a perfect spot to control the trade going up and down the Chesapeake. The people who had set up the settlement were from nearby Virginia, and they refused to acknowledge Lord Baltimore's right to govern them. It was only after a battle and some death that they acknowledged Baltimore's authority to govern the island. Baltimore's king-like powers was not always popular among the colonists that settled in Maryland. There was one case where a jury after returning a verdict that the governor didn't like, they were released and the jurors were fined for not coming up with the right verdict that the governor wanted. And so he impaneled another jury and fined the old jury. And maybe this was just a relic from medieval England in which juries were not always finders of fact, but providers of fact, but it was still kind of heavy handed. Part of the problem was that if Baltimore expected his colony to thrive and make money, he would have to attract colonists. And many colonists were not going to settle in a place in which they felt the government was heavy-handed or too oppressive. Baltimore governed his colony, even though they seldom were there. The Lords Baltimore were seldom in Maryland itself. But they governed the colony through a closed circle of cronies and friends and relatives, people they could trust, and they concentrated the power in just a few hands. Now, this didn't mean that all of their policies were always bad. They did have one important policy that was good. They required each farmer to grow a certain number of acres of corn so that they wouldn't starve like the Virginians had. If given a choice, farmers were always willing to grow tobacco because it made so much money. 
in the meantime, they would neglect growing food. So this policy in some ways was wise. If Baltimore had any intention of turning his colony into a refuge for oppressed Catholics, it must have quickly ended because it wasn't long before his colony was filled with Protestants. England was overwhelmingly Protestant, and the people coming to the colonies were overwhelmingly Protestant. In order to get along, Baltimore decided wisely upon a policy of religious toleration. Some of the earliest acts or formal government acts acknowledging religious tolerance occurred in Maryland. As long as you were Christian, whether you were Protestant or Catholic, they were willing to respect your religion and allow you to practice it the way you wanted as long as you swore allegiance to Lord Baltimore and followed the other laws. As good and enlightened as religious tolerance was, and I think really the Baltimores did it as a practical matter rather than a philosophical one, it did kind of backfire in some ways. Many of the Protestants that came to Maryland, especially the Puritans, were very hostile and intolerant towards Catholics. In fact, some of the Puritans that came there actually tried to set up their own independent colony within Maryland, and there were actually battles and killing. In 1688, the King of England, James II, fled England after a conflict with Parliament. James II was the last Catholic King of England. He had tried to impose Catholicism on England, and he had ended up in a quarrel with Parliament. And rather than being beheaded like his father, Charles I, had been, he fled instead. This had huge repercussions throughout the colonies. The New England colonies, of course, supported Parliament. They were happy to see a Catholic king leave. But Lord Baltimore in Maryland, who himself was Catholic, knew that they might face some difficulty with this. Being Catholic himself, Baltimore was particularly in a precarious situation. Seeing a Catholic king flee England emboldened Protestants in Maryland to form the Protestant Association led by John Coode. They seized control of Maryland in July of 1689 without firing a single shot, and they sent a request to the new king, William, asking him to, to give them a governor appointed directly by the king who would be Protestant. The new king agreed, and in 1692, the first royally appointed governor, Lionel Copley, was sent out to govern Maryland. There's an interesting intrigue that happened, though. Copley had debts in England. Lord Baltimore attempted to buy those debts so that he could then have Copley thrown in debtor's prison. I guess he thought that would stymie Copley's ability to govern what he thought was his province. I don't know if this would have backfired or not on to Baltimore because it might have irritated the king. The plot did not work, and Copley ended up becoming governor of Maryland. One of the ironies in this is that the Anglican Church there, thereafter, shortly thereafter, was made the official church of Maryland. So even though Catholicism was not the official religion of Maryland, and though it was not liked by the Protestant colonists, now they lived under the Anglican Church, which was now the official church of the province. That probably did not make some of the other Protestant sect, especially the Puritans, very happy. But that's how it went. In 1694, it was decided to move the colonial capital from St. Mary's, which was far in the south, to a more central location within the colony of Maryland. And the site that was chosen was named Annapolis. Governor Nicholson, who was the governor at the time, played a major role in designing the new city. He built it around two circles, a larger circle to house the state capital, and it was connected by a street to a smaller circle, which held the church, and then all of the streets radiated out from those two circles. If you look at a map today on Google Maps or an aerial photograph, you can see very clearly that this pattern still exists almost unchanged since that time. Annapolis has played an important and major role in American history. It was here that the Continental Congress was meeting when George Washington resigned his commission as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army just a few days before Christmas. They were meeting in the Senate chamber, and that chamber still exists today where Washington resigned his command. Also, Annapolis today is the place where the American Naval Academy is. Since 1692, the kings had taken control of the government of Maryland away from the Baltimores, and they themselves began appointing the governors. This changed in 1715. 
In that year, the current Lord Baltimore died, and his son, the new Lord Baltimore, made an important change. He renounced his Catholic faith, announced that he was a Protestant, and gained favor with the new king, King George I. The new king gave this new Lord Baltimore back the ownership of his colony, and from then on, it was a proprietary colony once again, which it remained until independence. Maryland and Virginia, as they aged together, became sister colonies. Maryland and Virginia, in many ways, were sister colonies. They had a very similar plantation culture, and both of them heavily relied on tobacco as their cash crop. Both of these colonies were in the process of replacing indentured servitude with black slaves brought from the Caribbean or Africa. Both of these colonies used tobacco as their money because British law prohibited the colonies from minting coins or printing paper money. So tobacco was literally used as money in both colonies. During early colonial wars, England had been able to take away some of French Canada's land. This was mainly the area of Newfoundland and New Brunswick, areas at the eastern tip of Canada. The people living there were mainly French, and they had, some of them had mixed with the Indians. They called themselves Acadians. As the French and Indian War began in the 1750s, the English authorities wanted to make sure that these French people living there would be loyal, but many of them refused to sign oaths of loyalty to the English, and what the English decided to do was to deport thousands of these Acadians and spread them throughout their empire so that they couldn't revolt or incite the local Indians whom they were closely allied with to help the rest of the French in Canada. In 1755, five boatloads carrying over 900 of these Acadians arrived in Maryland. That was the quota that Maryland was to take in. As Maryland flourished and became a wealthy, prospering colony, its upper classes, the wealthy planters, the tobacco plantation owners, these people wanted a bigger share in the power. They felt excluded by Lord Baltimore, and they resented that he kept power within such a small clique. And they, as well as everyone else in the lower classes in Maryland, resented that the Baltimores sponged so much money off of the Maryland economy for their own personal use. During the French and Indian War, the Maryland Assembly, who was dominated by the wealthy elite planters, the same ones that had grudges against Baltimore, pretty much refused to help the English cause against the French. Their excuse was that because Lord Baltimore was taking so much money out of the economy, they should get the money from him because they had none left to spare. It was a clever ploy because it pitted the king and his government against Lord Baltimore. It also saved the colony some money because Maryland didn't contribute all that much to the war effort against France. Throughout the year 1774, the colonies were reacting to the way in which England had clamped down on Boston, imposing what they called the Intolerable Acts. These were the result of the Boston Tea Party. During that year, members of the assembly who resented British rule to begin with in many instances because it excluded them from some positions of power, began to set up their own shadow governments. These started out as provincial congresses or conventions, they were sometimes called, who sometimes began looking into ways of organizing the colony and opposition. Maryland was no exception to this trend. And in the year 1774, we begin to see an erosion of British authority there, just as there were in all the other colonies, with these shadow governments, provincial assemblies, and congresses set up by members of the assembly, beginning to take control of the functions of government. Governor Eden, who was the last governor of Maryland, governor appointed by the proprietors of the Lords Baltimore, he was careful not to antagonize these provincial congresses, these county meetings, and so forth. Other governors, such as in neighboring Virginia, had tried to clamp down too firmly, and it led to more rebellion. Some of the patriot leaders had discovered that Governor Eden was giving information to the royal government about the best place to land troops and the best way in which to deal with some of the growing opposition that was occurring in Maryland. Some of the Patriot leaders, after consulting with John Hancock, who was president of the Continental Congress, decided the best way to handle the situation would be to 
kidnap Governor Eden, and the plan never went through. They were not able to kidnap him, and it kind of backfired because the other Patriot leaders felt that was going a little bit too far. However, they did pass a resolution inviting him to leave the state, and he did. Governor Eden climbed aboard a ship, and he had a pile of baggage on the shore there or on the dock, and there wasn't enough room in the ship for it. So he went out from this boat to a waiting British warship. The Patriot leaders, when it was requested that they send his baggage, replied that they wanted the British to return several loyalists who had fled to the ship for safety. When they refused, they decided to confiscate the governor's baggage. This was all just a few months before the Declaration of Independence was signed. And from that point on, Maryland was no longer ruled by Great Britain. Ultimately, the Lords of Baltimore never were able to establish the kind of medieval little kingdom that they had hoped to in the Americas. But they are not forgotten. If you look at the Maryland state flag today, it still has their coat of arms on it. It's one of the most complex flags of any state flag. For further reading, I recommend the following books and articles. Colonial Maryland, A History by Aubrey C. Land. Maryland, A Middle Temperament, 1634 to 1980 by Robert J. Brueger. A March of Liberty, A Constitutional History of the United States by Malvin I. Yurofsky. And The Palatinate Clause of the Maryland Charter, 1632 to 1776, From Independent Jurisdiction to Independence, by Albert J. Martinez, Jr., published in the American Journal of Legal History, Volume 50, Number 3, July 2008-2010.